Hi everybody, welcome once again. I'm Imran Garta and you're in the stream. Today, women's rights and misogyny in the Arab world. We look at the so-called war against women in the region. As always, our digital producer, Malika Bilal, is here looking out for all your live feedback via Twitter. During the show, you can, of course, tweet her your comments using the hashtag AJStream. And joining her on the couch is Mona Tahawi, a columnist and con commentator on Arab and Muslim issues. Uh, Mona, welcome to the stream. Now, uh, your most recent article <clears throat> about the war on women in the Middle East, it's created and is still creating a lot of uh, reaction online, some backlash as well. So we're looking forward to tapping into your thoughts with these uh, ongoing discussions. It's uh, a great pleasure having you on the show. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me, Imran. Okay, well, also here to help us ask the tough questions regarding women's rights is our Google Plus panel. Now, uh, we're glad that we have people from all over who want to weigh in on this issue. If you want to be in a future episode yourself, like them, you can follow us on Google Plus. Just add the stream to your circles, and then, like them, you can be in the stream. So just how ingrained is misogyny in the Arab world? That is one of the central questions Egyptian-American columnist Munad Tahawi asks in her recent piece, which is titled, Why Do They Hate Us? Well, since its publication last week in Foreign Policy magazine, Tahawi's bold statements against patriarchy and what she views as hatred against women have triggered a wave of responses online from feminists and academics to bloggers and tweeters alike. So what is the way forward in advancing women's rights in the region and what is stopping its progress? Is it really hate? Well, to help us discuss these issues is writer and commentator Nasreen Malik, who's joining us via Skype from London. She contributes to The Guardian and her rebuttal to Mona's article uh, called the piece A Misdirected Call to Arms. So Nasreen, welcome to the stream. Uh, looking forward to your thoughts as well. Let's start with Mona. You say, you know, you ask, why do they hate us? Who are they? First of all, I mean, clearly this title is a play on Fareed Zakaria's cover story in Time magazine shortly after 9-11, when he asked that now infamous question, why do they hate us, uh, as if an American is asking, why do Muslims hate us? And what I did with that title was reverse it, because back then, uh, soon after 9-11, and I lived in this country when the attacks happened, you would hear from some Americans that Muslims hate us because of our freedoms. And the point that my piece was making, intentionally provocative, I have to say, because this piece, I aimed this piece for the jugular. It, it was something I wanted to use to provoke. What my piece said was, we have no freedoms because they hate us. Again, as a way of provoking. What I'm now delighted to see is a massive discussion. I mean, it's, it's been seven days of people talking about women's rights, which for me is heaven. From the get-go, I don't speak for any woman. I know that some of, some of the people who've written rebuttals uh, are distressed that what they see is my uh, claim to speak for Arab women. I don't speak for Arab women, mm. I speak for myself. I'm an Egyptian who grew up between Egypt, the UK and Saudi Arabia. Mm. And I began my journalism career in Egypt where I focused a lot on women's issues. And I remain very connected to Egypt, especially since the revolution began and it continues. And so I, I wanted to use this piece because this is a very exciting time in, in all our lives. I'm glad to be alive for this revolution. And my contention is, we have a political revolution that removed Mubarak, the patriarch, but unless we have a social revolution which removes the patriarch with a small p, the Mubarak in our mind, in our bedroom, and in the streets, that's what I call misogyny. That's what I call the societal oppression of women. Mm -hmm. Unless we have that in tandem with our political revolutions, the political revolutions will fail. Nasreen, are you convinced? Muna is saying she was intentionally provocative. The whole point of it was to shake up the status quo, to get people's attention, and it has. No, absolutely. Uh, can I just say before before I start talking about the content of the piece, one interesting thing has been the responses to Muna's article um, from Arabs and especially Arab women and on Twitter. And there has been some vile abuse. And I think that that's uncalled for. And if, if it's taught us anything, is that we need to be able to learn to discuss these issues without actually resorting to um, name calling and and you know a delegitimizing the person who's making the claim. So I'd like to say that mm -hmm. I've seen some of the responses and I think that we actually have a problem um, when it comes to discuss discussing these issues. In that sense, I'm very happy um, that this article was written and that people can start this learning curve of learning to, dis to discuss these controversial issues in a mature way. 
Um, having said that, just to come back to your question and uh, what Mona said about Farid Zakaria's article, Why Do They Hate Us? Now, that article actually, I think, was problematic in that it created an atmosphere that justified the war on terror. It's not an article that we should be emulating in the sense that it normalized certain attitudes and it stereotyped Muslims and, and it kind of um, uh, expressed a, a view about Muslims towards uh, the US, which was not entirely accurate. And so I think that article is actually quite a dangerous article because these ideas seep into popular culture and then they seep into foreign policy and we've seen since that article an assault on muslims worldwide and what we say our ideas and our thoughts and what we write in in papers and journals and magazines seep into mainstream culture and so we have to be careful okay not to polarize okay um, and so and I, I, I can see that i can see the need for controversy but we also have to be careful not to polarize opinion okay mona mm. i'm gonna get your i'm gonna get your response to mm. what nasreen said about the title and how mm. politically loaded it is because mm. She has reeled in some other themes mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. uh, regarding this, particularly the war on terror and George Bush. But I want to bring in the community, particularly those on Google+. Plus. Exactly. Before we get to Google+, Plus, um, Nisreen, you mentioned something about polarizing. Um, there's a tweet here from Aida who says, I loved Mona's article because I felt I could have written it. However, maybe hate is not the word I would have used, but instead, instead disrespect. Um, before you comment on that, though, I want to go to Google+, Plus because there's a question there from Hazami, who's here in D.C. Hazami, go ahead. Hi. Well, I mean, I think that we're all on the same page. And I think most people who have attacked the article on the basis of it all do believe that indeed there is a long way to go in helping advance the rights of women throughout the Middle East. But I think uh, I asked the question to Muna in the creating the dichotomy of us versus them as men versus women, the, the discussion should not be that polarized. It should indeed be us as a global society who care about human rights and the rights of women versus them, the misogynistic practices that are seeping into our political systems and cultural systems. So I think the entire framing of the article was quite misleading in that it reduced the problem to a gender issue versus a societal institutional issue. Okay, Mona. Um, first, to go back to what Nisreen said, the last thing on my mind is to emulate Fareed Zakaria's article because I didn't agree with Fareed Zakaria's right. article and I've lived in this country since 2000 and I've spent a lot of time fighting Islamophobia. Many of my columns have been against the stereotypical images of Muslims in this country and just a few years ago I was protesting outside of Park 51 for the right of us, the New York Muslim community, to build an Islamic community center wherever we want. So I think it's quite bizarre that some people are saying that I'm, I'm using any trope of Islamophobia because that's the last thing on my mind and I actually made fun of Fareed Zakari's question in my essay if you read it carefully. Mm -hmm. but, but to go to Hazami's before question... You, before you answer that I want to, I want to mm -hmm. add something to it because it's on mm -hmm. the same theme. Mm -hmm. One thing that really upset a lot of people when I was monitoring the response yes. online was the pictures that, right. that were attached right. to it. So you have this kind of, you know, sexy niqabi body paint thing yes. going on, which yes. upset a lot of people because right. they felt it, uh, it cooked up all these orientalist themes right. Right. regarding Muslim women. Mm -hmm. And then to add to Hazami's question, you know, she talks about structural issues. She feels yes. this is a gender dichotomy that you've created, yes. whereas she's saying, hold on, we're talking poverty, we're talking post-colonialism, we're yes. talking all of these issues, uh, Muslim men, Arab men living under dictatorship. Yes. And usually this is used as an analogy, uh, metaphorically, you know, when a man gets fired at work, he goes home and beats up on his mm -hmm. wife. I suppose you can use that quite literally here. She's saying there's far more, there's far deeper structural issues here mm -hmm. rather than gender issues. What do you think? You know, having seen as many of the rebuttals as I could because I couldn't read them all because they're still coming in to this mm. day and I welcome again I welcome this feedback I'm quite distressed that people are obsessing over things like the artwork which the writer has nothing to do with the structure the headline the subhead everything but the actual issues that I'm talking about I gave actual facts and statistics from various countries in the region. The fact remains that out of the global gender index of 135 countries, every single Arab country is in the bottom 35. And many of them are in the bottom 10. That is a fact. That is not something mm. that the structure of my article gloss, uh, has made up right. or that the artwork has made up. So I would like to talk about the actual misogyny that happens on the ground. And so many of the rebuttals are about the headline, the artwork, the framing, the question, so many things but what I'm actually talking about. So I'm glad I would actually like people to, to address things like violence against women and the fact that we don't have a Violence Against Women Act in just about any of the countries in the region, actually, and other facts on the ground. 
And uh, what, what was your question, Well, Imran? to tie into what uh, Hazami was saying, is the macro right, the issues levels, which right, right. create well, the Well, that's where the Mubarak gender, comes in. Yeah. Now, I recognize that all of Arab society is oppressed by regimes. Clearly it is. That's why these revolutions are so amazing and wonderful, because people have been working towards these revolutions for years. These are not overnight affairs. But there's, there's a hierarchy of oppression here. As I said, Mubarak, or the regime, I'm using Mubarak here as a symbol. Mm. You know, put in the Saudi royal family, put in the Kuwaiti royal family, put in whoever you want. That regime oppresses all of society. My point is, in turn, society oppresses women. You will often hear that both male and female revolutionaries in Egypt have been sexually assaulted. I was sexually assaulted. My friend, a male activist with me, who was detained on the same night I was, was also sexually assaulted. Yes, that is true, because the regime oppresses everyone. But when I go out on the street as Mona, the Egyptian citizen, I face an incredible amount of sexual assault and harassment that my male right. activist friend does not face. This is what I'm talking about. This is the hierarchy of oppression and misogyny that I'm talking about that I want my essay to headbutt into so we can get beyond the structure, the headline and the pictures. Point strongly made. Malika. Hazami actually has a follow-up question yeah. on Google+. Plus. Hazami? Uh, when I was talking about structural issues, I wasn't talking necessarily about the article. I was more talking about the fact that socioeconomic status is often correlated to the acceptance of women in various social, socioeconomic kind of uh, levels within the region. I was talking about the fact that jobs and work are oftentimes, as we know, uh, we still have classes structures in the Middle East that are not perpetuated by men or women uh, in isolation of one another, but as society as a whole. And I will also add to the fact that a lot of women in the Middle East are responsible for perpetuating stereotypes about the fact that women cannot be included in certain areas and certain dialogues as it's a cultural issue. So I'm talking about structural issues in the sense that it is not a revolution-based uh, uh, structural flaw. It is something that I think is much larger, and you have to look at the fact. I mean, you cite in your article various um, situations. You talk about women not driving. That is specific to Saudi Arabia. Uh, you're talking about female genital mutilation. I grew up and lived throughout the Arab world, and I will tell you that is not practiced at all in the Levant. That is an Egyptian, uh, Egyptian culture does practice it, and you cite it in your article. Yes, but Egyptian culture also has a Nubian society and also pulls influence from Africa. So I think in generalizing to this degree, you've ultimately muted the voices of a lot of women who have been very active in challenging these type of societal and, and structural flaws in our mm -hmm. system for, for ages. And okay. so I think that is the comment that a lot of women are coming to this uh, from. Okay, Hazami, yeah, I'm, I'm very glad that Hazami mentioned the women who have been fighting this misogyny for a very, a very long time because I actually mentioned several of them in my article. I mentioned an incredibly courageous young Egyptian woman called Samira Ibrahim who has stood up to the military junta that currently runs Egypt and challenged them on these so-called virginity tests which are mm -hmm. essentially sexual assaults. Unfortunately, she lost in Egypt because of the injustice of our justice system, both civilian and military. But the fact that we have women like Samira Ibrahim and Manal Sharif in Saudi Arabia and so many activists on the ground of course we have activists on the ground who fight for these issues but the but the fact that they've been fighting for so long and that things are still that bad yes FGM is in Egypt it's also practiced in Kurdish areas and other mm -hmm. areas I didn't generalize and say FGM happens in all these countries I gave specific examples to show you how misogyny manifests in each of these countries but again when you look at the global gen gender index which looks at women's progress educationally politically and socially our part of the world falls solidly in when, the bottom when you say our, When you say our part of the world, are you saying Arab yes, or Muslim? Arab, because the I mean, Arab these things overlap, for yeah, example. I mean, 1.5 billion people, only 20% 20, uh, 20 of Muslims are Arab. No, I'm talking know, about so, the Arab world. Right. And, and, and this, this takes me into the, the other question. You know, often when I'm on US mm. television, in order to help the viewers understand what I'm talking about, I will call Rick Santorum the American Salafi. Mm. And I will say that in, in the United States, we have a Christian brotherhood, and that is the, the right-wing Christian coalition that uses a mix, a toxic mix of religion and politics. And I use that as a way for them to understand what the Muslim Brotherhood and other Islamists in the region do. So clearly, this is not a, specific, a problem specific to the, to the region. But as a feminist from Egypt mm -hmm. who has grown up in Saudi Arabia and who is familiar with that part of the world and familiar with how difficult the issues there are, sometimes I don't want to talk about America. Sometimes I don't want to connect it to America and I want to talk about our part of the world. And this is where the, the problem of feminists of color come in. Mm. As an Egyptian feminist, I am, or, and a Muslim feminist too, this is where the, the, the label Muslim comes right. in. 
I'm expected to pledge allegiance to my community before my gender. Hmm. But this is an issue now. I've come, to the, I've come to the stage where we've got revolutions going on where I want it, my gender to trump everything. Okay, I and this get... is always a problem of, uh, of feminists of color or different backgrounds. Okay, I want to ask Nasreen. Nasreen, do you feel you have to pledge allegiance to your community before your gender? And is that a problem? I think <clears throat> I, I agree with Mona that it is a problem. Um, that you need to you need to kind of nail your colors to a mast whenever you talk about um, Arab the Arab world and particularly Muslim women because hackles are raised very easily. Um, having said that, it's kind of our job to ensure that we don't raise those hackles. It's kind of our job not to phrase things in such a way as to alienate uh, readers and especially when it comes to issues so sensitive as religion and and sex and politics. Um, and it's something that I have learned over the past few years is that, that there is a way of actually couching what you say in a certain way that will appeal to people. Okay. We can't dismiss these feelings. We can't dismiss, and even in my article I say, we shouldn't be distracted by these things, but by the same time, we can't dismiss them. So, okay, you know, okay. Fair, fair enough. I want to throw a tweet to Mona before we go back to Google+. Plus. Jamil just writing in in the past 15 seconds or so. Uh, if you want to talk about our part of the world, why do you write in English to a Western audience? Uh, I suppose, you know, it's kind of the airing our dirty laundry type of yes. uh, theory. And also, I mean, I wanted to add to that, you don't suffer Twitter criticism gladly. I mean, you'd call some of them <laughs> trolls. Uh, you've used the F word for some of them. Many you said, times. I'll block you, you know. <laughs> Uh, doesn't that, as Nasreen says, tend to marginalize and polarize? First of all, I think in an internet age, it's disingenuous to say what language did you use because the magazine hasn't hit the newsstand and we've been talking about this for a week. Right. So clearly the issue of where did you publish it and in what language has not prevented the tremendous amount of feedback and discussion that has happened. And again, I gladly welcome that. There's a difference between rebutting someone's argument and attacking them personally. Right. And as Nasreen mentioned, I have been attacked personally many times over the past week. It is my right to not have to listen to that kind of attack. And that's where block is a godsend. <laughs> you are entitled to say whatever you want on Twitter and I am free not to hear it. When I block someone, I don't prevent them from expressing themselves. They're completely free to tweet to their heart's content. I am completely free not to have to listen to myself being called a whole host of uh, very abusive terms. The article has been translated. Now, here's an interesting twist. Mm. Very soon after my article came out, a Saudi feminist activist who focuses on domestic violence wrote to me and she said, Mona, your article is brilliant and Saudi women have to read this. Can I translate it into Arabic? And I said to her, please do. She translated it and it's soon going to be posted on the magazine's website. They're tweaking some of the translation. I asked her, do you want your name associated with my piece? Because I know how the controversy. The Saudi feminist activist said to me, the time for silence is over. Mm. I'm honored to be associated with your article. So, you know, he's tweeting to me in English. So clearly, clearly English is not a, question, a problem for him. Twitter, you know, and, and this discussion we're all having, we are all clearly cushioned in levels of privilege. Nasreen works in London, Hazami is in DC, I live in Manhattan. We clearly are all cushioned in privi uh, privi cushions of privilege. And I'm talking about women in the Arab world who are not cushioned with these privileges that we have. I am saying, let's look beyond our privilege that gives us freedom, that gives us mobility, and that gives us the kind of rights that we all take for granted. Mm. Look beyond that to the women on the ground who I hope and dream that these revolutions give these privileges too. But right now, it's really easy for us to talk on an orange couch about how it's not that bad. For the women on the ground, it often is. Well, Mara, okay. you mentioned uh, language of publication. There's a couple of tweets here on that issue in general. Uh, this is from Mina, who says, her platform of choice was Western, thus fueling the misconceptions the West already had about Arab men. Uh, and another tweet from Lisa, who says, why did she choose foreign policy as the media? Who did she primarily want to engage in debate? The American business slash policy elite um, but because we're inundated with tweets and Google Plus hold that thought okay. um, I'd like to go straight to Google Plus because Janabi has a question from New York go ahead Janabi hi Mona my question to you is what is particularly mis misogynistic about the Arab world compared to um, other parts of the world like South Asia uh, your article obviously singled out the Arab world right 
I'm glad you asked that, Janabi. Thank you for that question because I've heard from many women in Pakistan and India who said, why do you think the real war is on Arab women? I did not write that subhead, so that wasn't my choice of words to say the real war on women. I think, I think though, that that subhead was uh, intended at American women reading this who are themselves engaged in or defending women against the Republican-led war on women. So, you know, I think I, I said earlier, patriarchy exists globally. It is not exclusive to the Arab world. Misogyny exo exists globally. So absolutely, of course, for you as a, as a South Asian woman, you, but you will know much more about the kind of, the way misogyny manifests itself in, in the part of the world from which your family originates. As I said before, when I talked about feminists of color, there comes a point where I want to talk about my community. I can't speak about Pakistan and India because I'm not from there and I'm not familiar with the situation on the ground. I am familiar with the situation on, on the ground in many Arab countries because I've reported from there. So th my article was by no means an attempt to say everywhere else misogyny has been killed except for the Arab world. That's the last thing on my mind. But what I encourage you to do is to write your version of, of this article about what South Asia needs to hear about misogyny on the streets because I know I've heard from several of, of your kind of regional compatriots about what they want to see improved. Okay, Malika, do you want to do one more Google Plus? Um, actually, if you could go to the, um, there, since there's so many tweets okay. on the, the platform, yes. okay. if you could yep. speak to that. Absolutely. I think, um, I don't think that there's an Arabic magazine who would have published my piece as is. I would like for there, and if, if someone knows of an Arabic mm -hmm. magazine that would have published it as is, let me know. What happened is Foreign Policy magazine wrote to me and, and said, would you like to write an article about women's rights in the revolution? It, it, was, it was the sex issue, wasn't it? I yes. Mean, yeah. Well, they said we're, well, at the time they said we're working on an issue about gender and women's right. rights. And we're in, we, we want to know if you are interested in writing this piece. Now, the, the, the kind of the germination of this piece is that yeah. over the past year, I've written several columns for The Guardian. And interestingly, no one wrote to me after those columns and said, why did you choose The Guardian? Right. You know, it's Reen writes for The Guardian. I contribute for the, uh, to The Guardian. And I wrote several pieces that look specifically at gender issues, especially after these so-called virginity tests in which the Egyptian military junta basically sexually assaulted female revolutionaries. And I, I, I kind of sat back and, and watched the fallout, and it was a very quiet fallout. And I was dismayed, and my heart was smashed to pieces that female revolutionaries in Egypt, these incredibly Everyone, not just female, but, but female revolutionaries were targeted specifically with these sexual assaults by the military. So I've been writing these columns over the past year now, and, and then my own sexual assault and the way I was attacked very close to Tahrir Square in November, mm -hmm. where police, riot police broke my arms and I was detained by both the military and the police. This all just came to a head. And so when foreign policy said, would you like to write this piece? I said, I would love to, because this idea of the social revolution Having to run in tandem is very, very uh, is a very dear idea to me. I believe that the revolution that Mohammed Bouazizi sat, started by setting him, himself on fire will be completed by women. And when I say will be completed by women, clearly I'm giving women agency. Some of the rebuttals have said you've taken women's agency away. How have I done that when I've said Samir Ibrahim stood up to the military junta in a way that very few people have done? So that was that was the idea behind it. The fact that it was in English is because the the, the magazine commissioning it wrote to me and, and they, they publish in English. But I also had the audience in mind. I had clearly the region and, and the region has engaged. Okay. So in this case, English wasn't a problem. But when it comes to the US administration that has shamefully supported so many of the dictators in our part of the world, five US presidents supported Mubarak, they are utterly quiet when it comes to gender discrimination okay. in that part of the world. Okay, hold that thought because I wanna go to Leeds. Malika gives us a taste of some of the other stories that we're following. We'll continue this discussion in the online post show. Malika. Well, we're not in the habit of reporting news on ourselves, but this story is too unusual to ignore. Bahrain's foreign minister is using Twitter to call on citizens of Saudi Arabia and the UAE to vote against a documentary. Take a look. Bahrain, an island kingdom in the Arabian Gulf, where the Shia Muslim majority are ruled by a family from the Sunni minority. Where people fighting for democratic rights broke the barriers of fear, only to find themselves alone and crushed. This is their story, and Al Jazeera is their witness. The only well, that was a clip from Bahrain shouting in the dark, and it's up for a major award. I invite, I invite everyone to stand with Bahrain and vote against the harmful Al Jazeera film, Khalid Al Khalifa tweets. 
He links to a poll conducted by Radio Times asking their readers which nominee should win the 2012 BAFTA Television Award in Britain. There are now more than 400,000 votes on the site, thanks in part to his tweet going viral. But the poll will not affect the result of the award. BAFTA has the final say on that and will announce the winner on May 27th. Imran? Thanks for that, uh, Malika. Everybody, stay with us. We'll see you on the other side of this. Join us for the post show stream at aljazeera.com. We'll continue to discuss women's rights. Welcome back to the post show on stream.aljazeera.com. We continue to discuss women's rights in the Arab world in particular with Mona Tahawi and others. We've got a Google Plus Hangout. We have Rukaya, Janabi, Ali and Hazami in the Hangout. A few of you haven't had a chance so far. We're going to give all of you a chance before the post show is done. We promise you we've also got Nasreen who's standing by via Skype from uh, London. Uh, let's get Nasreen's response to what Mona was saying on the back end of the program. The stream. Um, so what was the particular point she was making? She's, she's, she makes a lot of points in a very short space of time. Um, Mona, what was, uh, what was the biggest point you were making? at the? Oh back? my goodness, I made many points. Okay, and they were all Let's, huge. Okay, let me take, <laughs> let me take the issue of, let me take the issue of, you know, the big, the big Mubarak and the, the, the small Mubarak. And the fact that uh, these revolutions cannot be completed without a social revolution for the I women think, of the region. Okay, this, this brings me actually to my, to my main point um, and the main point of my article. I, I have no problem with any of the things mentioned in Muna's piece. I completely and heartily agree that women get a raw deal in the Arab world. I'm Sudanese, I lived in Egypt, I lived in Saudi Arabia and in Sudan, and I've been at the coalface of all of these issues. That, that is not something that Muna should be attacked for. If there are problems, if there are violations, we should express them. My problem is reducing it entirely to gender animus, to a gender dynamic. And that links to Mona's point about the big Mubarak and the little Mubarak. Mubar the little Mubarak doesn't exist just in men's heads. It exists also in women's heads in the Arab world. And to come to the point of FGM in particular, FGM in my family, in my country, in my tribe, in Sudan, is almost exclusively a female-led initiative. It's the grandmothers, it's the mothers. But, and do we say, do we ask, do Arab women hate their daughters? We don't ask that question because it obviously isn't the case. And if you're going to argue, well, they don't hate their daughters, but they've internalized all these values and cultures in a misogynistic society, then the men have internalized them as well. So my point is to reduce it entirely to gender dynamics actually misdiagnoses the problem. The problem well, is a much wider, mainly political problem. Well, well but basically what you're saying is Mona didn't go far enough when she says, why do they hate us? Exactly. You're including... You're including Absolutely. the vast majority of women as well. Absolutely. I, the, the question is, isn't why do they hate us? The question is, why are we all like this? What, okay. what have we gone through and what have we suffered? I think we've just seen the birth of an alliance here. <laughs> <laughs> political retardation, we were never in disagreement. There's right. political retardation, there's social and um, economic stasis in the Arab world that has extended to all aspects of human rights and civic rights, minorities, religious minorities, ethnic minorities and women. And therefore, to just take the gender animus bit and blame it entirely for what's happening to women, and even then if we expand it to the fact that it's because it's a patriarchal society and a patriarchal society is mainly imposed by men, this again misses the serious structural issues that we have, okay. that we suffer from because of an extended period of political stasis in the Arab okay. world. Okay, Mona. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I, mean, I, I didn't doubt that Nisreen and I right. would be on opposite sides of this because I know that she cares deeply as much as mm -hmm. I do about women's rights in the region. But I think, you know, if, if we could go back 16 or 17 months 
And imagine having a conversation about overthrowing any of the dictators in our region, where none of them had been overthrown yet. We would have heard the same arguments about how the, the, the static political system in the Arab world is because, and people would have given you a whole host of things, including, for my country of birth, the fact that the Nile is a very docile river that has created very passive Egyptians who love to use humor against their dictator but will never rise up. So we had this idea of Arab exceptionalism, which I, have, I found incredibly disgusting. I don't think Arabs are different than anybody else. Else, we're all human beings. But what worries me now is that now that we have begun to remove our dictators and hopefully every single one of them will be removed within our lifetimes, when it comes to women, because it is an incredibly very sensitive subject, we're going to fall into this exceptionalism again. No, 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 don't talk about this now because our culture is like this, our religion is like this, and it's too sensitive. You make us look bad. This is different. Our women are different than anyone else's women. And this is what my concern is. Right. These dictators under which this incredible misogyny has been practiced were all nominally secular. So it's not about Islamist or secular. Mubarak was not an Islamist. What concerns me now is when I look a lot, a lot of, uh, at a lot of these countries and I see the Egyptian parliament, for example, 70% Islamist, who take a very literal approach to religion, I, th I say to myself, if under these so-called secular leaders or dictators it's been this bad, under these literal-minded uh, representatives, it's going to be this bad. Because we have members, Nasreen says, women who uh, uh, encourage FGM. Why do they encourage FGM? Because they understand what society requires of them in order for their daughters to be given that passport yeah. into acceptance. So we have to remove this idea that we're somehow different because of our culture and religion and put on the table every sensitive issue that we refuse to discuss because people could never imagine we would get rid of Mubarak or Ben Ali or Gaddafi, and we did. So we can get rid of this misogyny. That's my point. Well, it was fascinating as Shireen Ibadi had written this piece saying that Arab women don't repeat what happened in Iran. We got rid of the Shah, but women's rights were taken away even though women were at the heartbeat of getting rid of the Shah. <laughs> Ironically, 33 years later, the Islamic Republic of Iran, whatever you say about it, is still probably light years ahead of many of these Arab countries yes. in terms of women's rights. Yes. Exactly. I mean, Iranian women in the Green Movement were front and center alongside right. the men, absolutely. But Iranian women have, have honed their skills over the past 33 years because they understand what it's like to have been at the, for the center of a revolution, be made all kinds of promises and told mm. that it's a structural thing. It was the Shah. It was colonization. It was the CIA. It was when the CIA got rid of Mossadegh. You know, all of those things, which are all fine on paper. But when you talk to the actual women on the ground, mm -hmm. None of those things matter to them. What matter to them is the freedom and dignity that we're talking about for the whole region. Revolu a revolution that does not include the f freedom and dignity of more than half the population is not a revolution. Okay, Malika? We're talking about the region, but there's a tweet here from Harolyn who says, misogyny to me stems from the same place. Whether you're Muslim or Christian, it's the desire of men to control women. See U.S. Congress, and I think that speaks to your, to your point Absolutely. about centorum, uh, the, the American, American Salafi, Salafi uh, as you put it. But let's go to Google Plus because uh, there is a man and they're waiting to speak. Ali, go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, actually, it's a question to Mona. Um, I wanted to know what her um, what approach she would adopt to cause a sort of paradigm shift in women's rights uh, in the Arab world. Would it be an approach of sort of second wave feminists who in the 1950s, people like uh, Simone de Beauvoir and later Gloria Steinem, sort of protested, attacked and dismantled the cultural institutions mm -hmm. and legislation that discriminated against women mm -hmm. in the United States and Western Europe? Mm -hmm. Or would you believe more in a third world feminism, um, which argues for more, you know, cultural relativism, working within the framework of a given society's um, social boundaries? And the reason I ask this is a lot of her critics, um, you know, would sometimes say things like, we need to uh, to uh, reframe the argument within an Islamic sort of um, framework, uh, the Sharia framework. Or um, as one activist friend of mine who works in, in um, Africa mentioned, she, they stopped altogether talking about female mutilation and instead used terms like female cutting because it's more um, neutral of a term, which to me is really shocking. But I wanted to get her feedback uh, as someone who's an activist and, and has you right. know strong opinions on okay. that issue. Well, Ali, thank you for your question. I don't need to turn to Gloria Steinem or Simone de Beauvoir because we, and, and in this sense I'm saying the Arab region, have our own role models to turn to. First, I would go to Khadija, who was the first Muslim and the prophet's wife, uh, first wife. 
This is, uh, and we all know this story. This is a woman who was 15 years older than the Prophet. She was a businesswoman who hired him. She was a divorcee. She was incredibly successful and affluent, and she proposed to him. And when I look at Khadija, who existed in Arabia in the seventh century, I wonder what has happened to women in Saudi Arabia. I want the revolutionary brigade of Khadija to be out there leading the revolution. It's not about Simone de Beauvoir. When I look at Egypt, my country of birth, I think of Hoda Sharawi, who in 1923 removed the face veil and said, this is a thing of the past. I think of Doreya Shafi, who in the 1950s stormed the Egyptian parliament. She led a storming of the Egyptian parliament, demanding women's right to vote. She also led a hunger strike for eight days, demanding women's right to vote. And when Gamal Abdel Nasser turned into a dictator, she was one of the few people who was courageous enough to speak out against him and said, this regime has become populist and dangerous. And because of that, Gamal Abdel Nasser put her under house arrest for 15 years. Unfortunately, she committed suicide and her writings were erased from the Egyptian public record. So I don't need to find examples of Western feminism because one of the interesting rebuttals have been that I'm a Western feminist. I, I think I belong to the world as many of us do now because you know you live in the United States, you have family I'm sure in the region. So I turn to women like Doreya Shafi and I say if she was storming parliament in the 1950s, let's do it sisters, let's storm parliament now. I don't need Simone de Beauvoir to tell me how, how to run a feminist movement. Mm -hmm. I have very deep roots of feminism in the region that give me great great pride, but that also give me great hope because I look to them as the role models that I hope will inspire us for many years to come. Okay, let's ask Nasreen. Nasreen, are there Western or Eastern feminists or is a feminist a feminist a feminist? And f uh, listen, feminism to me is a very personal thing. When people, I think, try and over-intellectualize feminism mm. and they try and give it color and nationality and models, Western versus Eastern feminism, at the end of the day, what's wrong is wrong and what's unjust is unjust. And we shouldn't be distracted by trying to kind of emulate certain models of feminism. If something unjust is happening, it's a human instinct to try and fight it. And therefore, I think that, as Muna said, there have been women on the ground, especially in Egypt, especially in Tahrir Square, we saw these amazing models of Arab women just not taking it because it's just wrong. And so in that sense, I have a lot of faith in Arab women, okay. especially, especially Arab women uh, who have been, um, where it's been a, 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 um, a double whammy in that they are working class and that they are uh, bread, breadwinners for their family and their women as well. They have been the warriors in the revolution. So in that sense, I'm not, I'm not interested in discussing models and, and, and you know, d different intellectual uh, heritage when it comes to feminism. Feminism is something women resort to when an injustice happens. It's as simple as that. Okay, well, One of the things that was, that's brought up in this conversation is Arab exceptionalism. Rama Kudemi on Twitter says, it's not Arab exceptionalism, it's a history of colonialism and a post-colonial reality of Western-backed dictators. And that's something that we haven't talked about yet. Um, but before we actually delve into that, I want to go to Google Plus because Hazami actually has a question for you, Nisreen. Um, I mean, this kind of goes to Nisreen and also touches on what Muna has already talked about with this idea that West versus uh, people domestic or people who live in uh, the region. I think I would go back to my point that oftentimes a lot of this uh, misogyny and a lot of this uh, 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 seclusion actually happens in rural communities throughout the Middle East that A, do not have access to the internet, are, uh, have a lot of illiterate community members. And as women of the Western diaspora, as you mentioned, Muna, with, flu uh, with privilege, um, and Nisreen, to your point of us being able to kind of engage in this dialogue with them, uh, we are still perceived as outsiders. So as Arab and as Muslim, I perceive myself to be, the reality is if we get into the heart of some of these communities that are not receptive to international engagement, although we are of Arab origin and of Islamic uh, you know, uh, religion, it still does not allow us to open these doors and have these discussions. And I think that's my big uh, kind of issue with this idea of writing scholarly pieces to address issues on the ground that are still not getting to the heart of the problem. I, I completely agree. I, I always have this feeling. I feel slightly embarrassed and slightly impotent whenever I write about Arab women because I think I'm writing, you know, in a Western in a Western publication, mostly read by Western uh, people. T two things I would like to say very quickly. Number one, I think that we should write uh, wherever we can, and we should speak wherever we can because everything really is interconnected. Um, and there are certain ideas and ideologies and perceptions that do affect policy. 
And Mubarak was, uh, 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 was supported massively by the US administration um, because there was no pressure on the US administration to help Arab women. So in, in that sense, I, I do think that there is a trickle, drip, drip effect um, when women write about women's issues in Western publications. And so I think there is an impact um, on, a, on, a, on a slightly sort of rarefied level that does drip down. The second point, and this is a very important point, and thank you for raising it, I worked at the UN in Sudan. Uh, for a long time where they were trying to reach out to rural communities to talk about two particular issues, FGM and contraception. Um, Western white women weren't received, obviously white men weren't received, and even women like us who weren't really kind of of the village or of the, of the tribe weren't, weren't received. So there was delegation. You find agents on the ground that you can support and that you can delegate. And therefore, you create a chain. And I've seen this happen beautifully in Sudan, where you create a chain. Sometimes the top of that chain is in an NGO in London or Paris or New York. And there's a local Sudanese representative. And then there is another more indigenous local person who can reach out. And I think that's, that's, the, that's the trick. The trick okay. is to reach out to local representatives. OK, my final little point to, to Mona, a tweet that just came in a minute ago from B. Uh, Oasis Dragon saying, don't forget Dr. Nawal al-Sadawi. Absolutely, I put her, I add her hmm. to the list of Doreya Shafi and uh, Hoda Shahrawi. Nawal Sadawi is 80 years old. She was in Tahrir Square every day. She would be taken by a man on a motorbike to the square and back to her office. And, and she's absolutely one of the pioneering kick-ass feminists in the region. And you know, th those role models I mentioned mm -hmm. have their younger counterparts in Tahrir Square today, in feminist movements on the ground. I mean, I got a, a message yesterday from one of my feminist heroes in Egypt, a woman called Azza Suleiman, who works with working class women in disadvantaged neighborhoods in Cairo. And I've gone to Azza's legal aid center and covered what she does there. She helps ordinary Egyptian women who often are the only breadwinners of their family, either because they've been abandoned by the men in their families or they've been divorced and have no financial aid. And I, what I do as a writer, what my job is, to, to, to take that reality that Azza tries to wrestle with and give it amplify it, not to speak for those women, but amplify the kind of work that Azza does. Yeah. And so when Azza wrote to me and said, thank you for your article, it was really good. That for me says, we're having a really interesting discussion here. Other feminists in Egypt have not liked my article and it's absolutely their prerogative, but it's in that argument. It's in those who say I liked it and those who say I didn't like it, that we have this intense discussion that moves beyond the painful places. And the painful place, the most painful is you made us look bad. I'm not the one who makes us look bad. I love that part of the world. It's a deep part of me. It's the practices on the ground that make us look bad. And every single one of us here, Google Plus community and here in the studio, are invested in fighting human rights abuses. And misogyny is a human rights abuse because women's rights are human rights. Absolutely. I think it's, that's it's a good point. Okay, Nasreen, we have... We have run out of time, so in 30 seconds, if you can, please. No, absolutely, in 30 seconds. <laughs> this is actually, and just this is to, to go back to, to the question as well, this is a very important time. Um, Muna says people aren't discussing women's rights. You cannot move for discussions on Arab women's rights in the Western world at the moment. And the foreign policy uh, picture actually displays that there is a stereotype that has developed about Arab women. So the role of people who are of the culture and who can write, who are pejoratively called native informants, is to try and unpack the stereotypes. Because this is the time when people's perceptions are going to be crystallized. And therefore, that's why I think people have responded to this a little bit negatively in that they believe that everybody attention is on us, everybody's listening, and we shouldn't actually reduce it to something much simpler than what we see on the ground every day. I think but, that's an... but, but I've shown the female revolutionaries on the ground that are breaking apart these stereotypes. I think we, we, we have this discussion, of course we're talking about it. The past week has been full of these discussions. But I think if we spend too much time fighting stereotypes, we don't actually talk about the issues that we need to fight. So we're actually in agreement, but we're coming at it in different ways. Okay, now I think they're going to cut off the electricity at some point here, <laughs> so we really have to end the discussion now. Thank you very much, Mona, Nasreen, and everybody in the Google Plus Hangout as well. Malika, very quick mention, it's somebody's birthday today. It, it is, it's the stream's first anniversary. Um, and we want to have a, a thank you to our community for uh, allowing us to get this far. Thank Should you I very much. You happy birthday. Yeah, why not? Happy go, birthday go. to you. Happy birthday, the stream. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. <laughs> hip hip hooray. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Hope you join us tomorrow where we talk the economic situation in Greece, uh, the rise of some political groups which some find unpalatable, and whether Greece will have some sort of knock on effect in Europe, all amid an upcoming election. So join us for that. See you soon. Bye bye.